Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Oh my, still recovering from the holidays. Uh, hope you are fully recovered and hunting again. We still got a little bit of time left in our season out here in the West, and some of you in the South East and the Southwest have a lot more time. So, officially, you're on notice that I am extremely jealous. Hey, we got a great show in store for you. So many questions about dog training challenges, many of them focusing on fetch and retrieve concepts. So, I went to the top dog in that world. We'll be talking with Mike Stewart of Wild Rose Kennels about, oh, every aspect of that coming up real soon. Of course, the usual stuff that uh, pays off for everybody every day, a public access tip, some hunting strategies and dog handling advice. Sure would appreciate a subscription to the podcast, a rating or review. So please take care of all of that in your free time. And in the meanwhile... Oh, let's thank our friends at Sage and Breaker for their sponsorship. These folks have got it together. Uh, Some of the stuff that's sold out over Christmas is coming back into play. The inventory is being filled up yet again. And in the meanwhile, take a look at that brand new gun cleaning chamois. It's made out of a micro suede fiber, so it's washable, reusable, very absorbent, so it gets all that gunk off, and then you just toss it in the washing machine, or actually you hand wash it, and then it's ready to go again. Learn more about it and everything else in their heirloom quality gun care and gun cleaning products at sageandbreaker.com. And dogtra.com, where you get a 10% discount with the code SLUN. 10 on anything over 200 bucks including their t and b dual collar run two dogs with one transmitter handheld transmitter that has two sets of buttons so you're not trying to mess with a screen or press buttons with your gloves on on the screen it's all right there two sets of buttons that you can see feel and use so simply the dogtra t and b dual find out more at dogtra so without further ado let's get down to the phones and mike stewart at wild rose kennels now mike uh is in the retrieving world uh a household name i guess that'd be safe to say mike welcome to the podcast thank you for having me scott you know if they don't know you they know your dogs drake and deke the ducks unlimited mascots uh from ducks unlimited tv uh all sorts of other things in that world you know i could go on and on about your qualifications you do workshops you did a book you've got all sorts of stuff on your website um way back uh, like me you have a uh, have had a lot of other experiences from law enforcement to um uh US Navy reserves can you just kind of give us the the gist of 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 what you're doing these days at Wild Rose Kennels what's the philosophy and what are your activities there well I'd be happy to uh Wild Rose has been around for several decades uh, specializing in British imported labradors um, primarily, I like a lot of different varieties of breeds of dogs, but we found this one fits, fits our, our mission the best because this breed of dogs is a bit smaller. They're more compact. They have uh, great noses, uh, natural game-finding ability, and that's what we're looking for, as much of a natural dog as we possibly can produce. And then we developed over the generations of uh, working these dogs the methodology we call the Wild Rose Way, which is balanced training. Uh, which we use to develop upland and waterfowl dogs. And then about 10 years ago, we broke into a, a new subject on adventure dogs, hiking, biking, camping, canoeing, dogs of the outside sports. You know, wing shooting is not a rapidly growing sport, and we were looking for ways to bring people back to the, the outdoor market with canines. And we have found that the adventure dogs brought people back first off because they wanted an outdoor companion. And the next thing you know, they buy a shotgun and start taking lessons to start hunting with us. So it was a good reverse uh, engineered way to bring people into the sporting world with uh, gun dogs. And then we do service dogs as well. We have a service companion, a nonprofit section of the wild rose kennels across the country that we have a 
person that is certified to uh, take these same dogs and turn them into service companions. And we got them scattered all over the United States. So we already have three operations, the Upland Waterfowl Dog, the Adventure Dog, and the Service Dogs. We also now have, in the last couple of months, years, excuse me, not months, the last couple of years, diversified into three different areas of the country. We have Hillsboro, North Carolina, which is north of Chapel Hill, a first full-service kennel there. We have one in Dallas, Texas, which has been up for a couple of years at, at the Dallas Hunters and Fishing Club. That, that kennel and that shooting grounds actually dates back to 1885. That's the oldest shooting grounds west of the Mississippi River. We have a kennel presence there on those shooting grounds. And then we, of course, have Oxford, Mississippi. That's our oldest kennel. It's been there for decades. They're all producing the, the same dogs, all producing the same training methodology, all certified and trained uh, by the Wild Rush trainers. And basically, my job is now is to move between those kennels, providing uh, support, training support, training the trainers, uh, oversight, quality control, and so on. And we also have shooting uh, other two other training grounds on right now is in Jasper, Arkansas, is a river training in the winter. And we have a summer training in Colorado to run finished dogs at high altitudes to have them ready for hunting season. So we have these different diverse locations across the country to better serve our clients. I think I've got uh, my eye on the Colorado uh, facility because you also ha are adjacent to some pretty world-class trout fishing there, and that's my other passion. So uh, watch out. Someday I'll give you plenty of warnings so you can be away <laughs> while I pass through there. Uh, you know, I don't. I, uh, the first question I have for you wasn't on the list, and that is, do you ever find time to actually go hunting? Oh, yes. Um, we... We're right now we're in Arkansas and I'll check in on the training grounds here. Then I'll head to uh, Texas for quail. And then we're back to uh, the Dallas uh, Safari Club. We'll appear, have appearances there to do workshops and then we're back hunting again. So we move around and do different hunts in different parts of the country. You go pop on our different sites, you'll see them, the different places they're hunting on the eastern seaboard from North Carolina. Texas is doing a, has a lot of hunts down and going on that are very successful on ducks. So, yeah, we do a lot of – my particular passion is upland. Although I've trained two ducks and limited dogs, I, I love quail trucks and pheasants. So <laughs> that's that's really – I'll always opt out for the tr quail truck. Well, we're going to get along just great, Mike. That is Mike Stewart <laughs> of Wild Rose Kennels. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. And, um, Mike, here's how this all started. I ask my listeners uh, every week what they uh, what what kind of challenges they're facing, what they want to talk about on this podcast. And uh, boy, did I open a can of worms when I asked about the <laughs> biggest dog training challenges they face. Uh, we dealt with a lot of that uh, recently, uh, but there seemed to be a recurring theme, and that theme was retrieving. And some people would call it force fetch. Some people call it conditioned retrieve. You know, you've heard a million of those. Um, and I thought, well, geez, I could go to somebody who uh, who might know something, or I could go to somebody who knows a whole lot about it. And uh, so you were my go-to guy. And so the first thing I did when I arranged for this phone call was found out, of course, that um, force fetching is uh, really not in your vocabulary. Um, it's not in mine either in the traditional sense of the word. So, uh, again, I think we're probably on the same wavelength. But tell me about that, and then we'll jump off from there. Okay. Uh, force fetch is a – I guess it, you mentioned that I'm – I have a background in law enforcement, and we teach our. We used to teach our officers the uh, a continuum of escalation of force. You don't immediately draw your gun on somebody when you make a pull over a car. So, but if the knives will show up and the violence shows up, you es it's an escalation of force. So somewhere in that line, force fetch exists in about every training uh, uh, trainer's tool belt, but. It is not a primary one that we go to at Wild Rose. We are we provide a methodology we call balance training, and so we use positive reinforcement as much as possible without escalating the force. We we try to think through the problem and find strategies to get the dog to respond without de immediately defaulting to force. Uh, find force begets force. Once you get into the force mentality, you start going down that road. 
one thing leads to another thing, and I'm not really running into any forced methodology that doesn't end up with a problem someplace else that you have to fix. So generally when you're training dogs that we do, we, our, our basic mission is to bring out the natural ability of the dog, apply controls, and train the owners, train the handlers. So force fix really doesn't fit in that continuum anywhere. Now we do bird dogs the same way, we do spaniels the same way as we do the lab. Don't think because you have a pointer, I wouldn't do this exact same thing because our German short hairs are trained exactly the same way. Yeah. If we have our German short hairs, we have to have pointers, obviously, to train the upland side. Our lab back, and they strike, they flush the birds, they retrieve the bird. So we have to have pointers, but they're trained exactly the same way. Man, I am liking what I'm hearing. I've used the exact same term, continuum of force, from a law enforcement background, the same thing in my book, and I bet it's in your book somewhere as well, and, and I love that idea. But here's the big question, because uh, quite often um, the first force we use on a dog when we're we're doing a, a real force training uh, strategy is an ear pinch or a toe pinch so that they open their mouth and understand that when I say that word fetch, the mouth opens up. How do you do that? Well, the question I have is why do you do that? Yeah. Because if one, if we have a dog that has natural ability, remember my mission is to bring out the natural ability of the dog. If the dog has natural ability, why do you have to force the dog to bring out that natural ability? It could be through reward. It could be because the dog wants to do it, and then you merely attach the command fetch with it. Our dogs, there's very, I can't even remember the last time I force fetched a dog. I can do it if I have to, as a if, if it's in the necessary, but it's the last, it's the last thing. Well, what you just said, that is the first thing. Yeah. Basically yeah. you're using force to start with without even trying to see if the dog has any natural ability. And let me ask you a question. Where did force fetch even come from? Where was it actually designed? Well, I don't know the history of that and, uh, and, uh, probably ought not know because I'm, I'm betting it was probably a deep, dark, training secret some <laughs> somewhere in the middle ages well i'm going to tell you where it was actually designed it was actually developed in the late 1880s in mississippi the black belt was king of the quail in those days uh, the black belt from mississippi and the trainers had bird dogs that would not retrieve so they developed the method out i remember my father actually force answered a dog and i was a mere child they know what he was doing so that was somewhere about 1956 so it's been around a long, long time. And let me ask you what has benefited the American pointer in learning to have a natural retrieve. Almost nothing. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. still have to be force-fed. I, so I, after 100 years, it's done nothing for the genetic abilities of the dog to retrieve. I, I get it. And I'm I'm for it. I, I love what I'm hearing here, Mike. And it is uh, it is something that we discuss a lot, not just on the podcast, but on social media and in my blog as well. But so so if we're trying to bring out the natural ability of let's just take Waylon, the eight month old wire haired pointing Griffon that one of my buddies has. Um, how do we start that process with a dog that's not natural, not a retriever breed per se? So um, let's talk about that for just a moment. What are you going to do first with a young dog that you want to cultivate the retrieving uh, natural ability? So if one is not retrieving, then I've got to ask myself as a trainer, why? Why mm -hmm. is he not? Mm -hmm. So you've got in, in my book, uh, Sporting Dog Retriever Training the Wild Rose Way, I have a thing called the problem solving matrix. So it's, it's very simple. Just draw four boxes. I'll ask you uh, listeners to draw four boxes and on, on top of each other. One, two, three, four. And it's a matrix. So you, they're stacked. Number one is genetic. Number two, second box would be your methods. Number three would be your relationship. And number four is your ability, ability as a handler. So somewhere in one of those four quadrants is your problem. Yeah. So anytime I have a trainer comes to me with a trainer training problem, I say, what quadrant are you working in? Have you explored the others? So that's the first thing about it. Okay. Yeah. Waylon genetically did mom and dad retrieve. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's the, they did. Okay. Yeah. Then we're, we, genetic is not there, mm -hmm. but why did they retrieve? Were they forced? Here's what happens into the Labrador. 
you end up with a Labrador, which is Labrador retriever should be retrieving naturally. But mom and dad were not natural retrievers that were force fetch, or we don't know because they were force fetch. Mm -hmm. Granddad and grandma on the top and bottom lines were force fetch. So we don't know we have a natural retriever or not. Then you buy that pup and you take it home and it has no natural ability because genetically it's not there. It was not bred for. Mm -hmm. So as we know, as breeders, anything that you don't breed for in your program, it's going to get deselected over a period of time. Love of water, natural, natural ability to retrieve, the prey instinct. So that could be Waylon's problem. Mom and dad didn't retrieve, and you went and bought the dog thinking he would retrieve, but he's got no retrieve in him. Yeah. Now, we move to, now we move to column two. Is it your methods? Have you bored the dog? Have you tried different things, such as bring out the, nat uh, the uh, natural ability would be what's, what is a uh, natural ability of any bird dog is the prey instinct. We got to get him chasing things. We got to get him fired up about going after things. So, have we tried rolling a tennis ball down the driveway on, on a hill? That's one of the things I'll do with a dog if he's reluctant to retreat. Just roll that tennis ball. If he chases that tennis ball, ultimately he's going to grab it, and then you bet lots of reward, big reward. So you bring it. That's a that's a possibility. Then we look at the relationship. Are the kids playing games with the dog? Chase, tug of war. You're giving the dog chew toys. They can run around the house with and play with and chew with. Your district could develop a hard mouth. <laughs> he's not bringing anything back. So basically, you've got to look at the day in the life of the dog. and Anything you're putting in that you repeat over and over again, you better like it. So anything the kids could be doing with the dog or you're doing with the dog incorrectly, giving a bird too early, let him play in with the birds, play in tug of war with him, chase with him. He gets a bumper and runs off with it, and you start chasing him. You're putting in a problem you've got to take out later. So you're violating Wilder's Law. So then you look at your handler's ability. Are you rewarding the dog? Are you getting frustrated? Are you getting mad? Dogs, young dogs like that at his age, don't follow unstable leaders. You've got to be a stable leader, and you got to catch the dog doing the behavior you want and modify it by rewarding it. So you may just pick the ball up and take two steps towards you, reward it. Yeah. You know, so you that's proximity. You know, get as close as you can. So change the bumpers, change the time of day, change the terrain, change up everything you possibly can before you resort to force fetch. That's my point. Yeah, and your point is well taken, Mike. This is um, this is the thing that so many people forget. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, amplify on on a couple of things. The first is most of us don't pay as close attention as we should to our dogs and what they're doing and what we're doing to them. I, I think we take a lot of that for granted. And then it ends up being a problem um, in one of those boxes, absolutely. And then the other thing is we our expectations are so high. And let's get back to Waylon because Paul's a good guy and he's, he's going to make it. He's a, a first-time uh, pointing uh, breed owner. Um, but he... He sees uh, dogs on TV, or he reads the books, or he sees the magazine articles, and, and, and so many dogs are, quote, finished, unquote. He thinks that just going to happen overnight. We, we need to realize that, like you said, the two steps towards you is, is massive progress for a dog that's never taken two steps toward you before with something in his mouth. Um, do you see that happening more and more with some of your, uh, I'll call them customers, your, you know, the wild rose pack, your, the, the people who get dogs from you, are their expectations often unrealistic or have you trained them by then? Uh, unfortunately, we don't get all the training as we'd like to in our clients. You know, they'll yeah. bring a dog to us yeah. and they visit only once or twice in the whole process, maybe only once. But we have workshops and we encourage them to come. So what I try to do is if they're going to train their own dog or handle their own dog, I try to, to tell them that, that training, when you, when you, I just finished a trainer's class last week, two weeks long, and the, sent these dogs out to our, I'm a dog, since our, yeah. sent our um, trainers out to the different, locations that we have i ended with what is a trainer one a trainer is a mechanic and that's where most people are how do i fix this what tool do i fix this what method do i fix this but let's look at the other strategies you also have to be a behavioralist mm -hmm. you also have to be a teacher to teach the dog and as a trainer you have to teach other people but you also have to teach the dog through structure 
and reward and getting the dog to put in predictable behaviors or have develop predictable behaviors, I should say. So when we're looking to balance this, you have to also be a problem solver. You have to think, what is causing this problem? Am I the problem? Uh, is it something I'm doing in the day of the life of the dog? Is it, you know, you're training 20 minutes a day, but now we got the rest of the day and night. What's he doing? And what's he learning? He's always learning. Exactly. The, yeah. The dog is always learning. You better be careful what you put in. So there's where we spend a lot of time trying to teach uh, our clients and other people that any dog can come, any sporting dog can come to our workshop. We try to teach this type of, of mindset. And then we can talk mechanics. Let's talk mechanics for a moment. Now we've got Waylon, and he's, okay, he's picking up a ball every once in a while, running around with it, tossing air. We've got a big game going here. So it's okay. There we got to start. Now we have to teach him to deliver. There we use our, our positive hold techniques that I explained in our book. How we use pressure point manipulation to develop the dog to hold and ultimately bring us whatever they have in their mouth. So we don't use force fetch initially, or, or ever if we have it. We only use the pressure points. And through that manipulation, it's a massage technique. And then we move it, we take it around, uh, and, and make sure we take it to all different types of locations, five times in five different locations, each step before we can say we have whole conditioning down. So probably going to take two to three weeks. Sure. Okay. You got, I got to stop you right there because there's a term I've never heard before in dog training, pressure points. Tell me pressure more. Point manipulation. All right. Okay. We developed, well, there's a, there's quite a number of points on the dog that is nerve centers. Sure. And one is at the base of the skull, right where the neck and all those nerves come into their spine. Second is right behind the jaw underneath the ear underneath the earlobe and the third is the ridge of that paw the top of that paw mm -hmm. there are others back behind the shoulders but that's the only three i use in hold conditioning so we put the object in the dog's mouth and we teach him to hold put it in there clamp it and he le learns that the clamp down on it and the massage continues but here's the here's the step people they put them on the table and start force stretch they put them on the table and start the massage technique I'll have them on that table doing the massage techniques a week or two before we ever put anything in their mouth. Yeah. They're already yeah. anticipating getting on that table and it's a very pleasant place to be. Yeah. So he, they hop up there and I'm overworking in my trailer and then we go out and do something fun. And so they already know place. They already know how to get on the table and off the table and make a big game out of it. And then I start the, the uh, technique of, of um, the massage and there's the specific ways, light pressure, that you're doing to massage, and you will just see the dog's eyes closed, go relaxed. You can put on some mood music if you want, but it's not necessary. And get the dog very, very relaxed, and then he hops up on the table. He wants to be there. He wants to do this. Yeah. Then you slip the dowel in his mouth, which is a wooden dowel. I don't use a bumper in case we have a little issue and he doesn't like doing this. I don't want him to start pushing out the bumper out of his mouth. You don't want the association. It, yeah, yeah. Okay. If he has trouble, and occasionally we get into one that is mouthy or rolls his tongue, I'll put a glove on, put the glove, uh, the gloved hand in his mouth and teach him that way I can feel his tongue and level it out and teach him what the, the pressure should be, and then I'll go back to the dial. And I, as soon as the dial's in his mouth, he starts to massage. If he drops it or just spits it out, the massage stops. So he learns to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, you know that is it, it. It sure it sure is more convenient than a food treat. It, well, treats are problematic. You start food treat, they're yeah. cold, and you, you that's a that's totally dysfunctional because you're teaching the dog to spit something out and take the treat. Uh, problematic. I did I tried that one 15 years ago, and it 20 years ago, and I figured out that one's just not going to work well. So I stay away from the treats at all uh, mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. does develop in it so you don't want to put in something you got to take out later yeah yeah now we when the the whole condition is going on and they're starting to enjoy it they want to hold because the massage continues they figure that out and any plant time you put force into your program it's going to show up somewhere else so you do force fetch and the dog will say a soft dog and you do it incorrectly you don't spend enough time doing it building it structurally that dog has three options now everybody knows two flight or flight right sure 
But he he's got another one. Total avoidance. He just quits. Yeah. He sits there. And, then you got trouble. And then you have trouble. That's hard to fix. You um, man, you are you're strumming the right chords for this musician. That's for sure. This is good stuff. In that, it is a total and uh, and complete uh polar opposite if you will of some of the other uh ways to teach this stuff i love the idea of what i'll call uh constant praise or constant pleasure and do you add to that any any verbal praise of any sort while you're going through this process well the you know dogs communicate in three ways yeah body language tone and the least effective is, is what we say. They uh -huh. don't really, dogs don't talk. So what I do is I will use the tones. You, it doesn't really matter what you say. You say, good boy, good hold, good hold. You want a calm, soothing voice. And then as soon as he drops it, spits it out, I change it. Ah, what are you done? I change the tone, mm -hmm. not necessarily what I say. And as soon as the dial goes back in his mouth, or the, later on the bumper, and the massage starts again, the tone changes. So your tone and facial expressions are very important to the animal. Not so much what you what you say. Well, this is fascinating, and um, we're just getting warmed up, everybody, here at the Upland Nation podcast. Mike, um, hold on as we take a very brief break, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the must-have pieces of gear that every bird dog owner should bring with them most of the time. So, Mike, love your feedback on that as well, and then we'll get back into a whole raft of listener questions along these lines. So, one moment, please, while you listen to this commercial announcement from my good friends at ESPAmerica.com. I told you before, and I'll tell you one more time, I'm wearing my ESP America hearing protection devices in the field now, as well as at the range for a whole bunch of reasons. That little niggling buzzing in my right ear is uh, is not getting any worse, and that's one reason why. So make your New Year's resolution to keep your hearing intact. Don't forget, hearing loss is cumulative, and you can't get it back with a pill, with a surgery, or with anything else, including chanting mantras. 30-day money-back guarantee at ESPAmerica.com. Custom fit so they'll stay in when you're chasing chuckers and falling off that cliff. Don't ask why I know that. All right, so let's get back into the show. And Mike Stewart of Wild Rose Kennels. Mike, did you fall asleep during my commercial announcement? Not at all. I agree with you. Good, and good on you. I hope you're doing it, too. Um, well, I did it a little bit late in life. I'm, a, I'm, I'm afraid I've lost a lot of hearing, so yeah. your listeners need to listen. <laughs> yeah. and, and then some of them say, what? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm sorry, right. cheap joke. Okay, so this, Mike, Mike Stewart, this is called the Handle It segment, where we cover all sorts of stuff that I've learned the hard way that hopefully other people won't have to because of that. And I thought it'd be fun to ask a real pro who's moving back and forth between four or five, uh, 112 destinations every year, it sounds like for you. Um, when I'm on the road, the most convenient and handily located item I have in my truck is a tie-out stake for my dog. I like that because you can put it anywhere, hopefully in a quiet, safe place, but no matter what you do with it, your dog is safe and you don't have to keep your hand on a leash the whole time. You can get all those other chores done. How about Mike Stewart at Wild Rose Kennels? If you were to narrow it down to one thing you were taking with you all the time, what would it be? Hmm. Uh... I can think of three, but I'll name the top one that I expect all my clients to have and all my trainers to have with them. Me and I've got them in every door of the truck, both sides of the truck, my game bag, my blind bag, everywhere is a slip lead. Mm -hmm. and I can drop it on the dog at any time that I need to gain, regain control. Um, I can pull him out on the side of the road to air him. So I've got a slip lead in each side of the door, the one in the, in the back, back of my hunting vest, blind bag, just to keep the dog under control if you start to have an issue. Yeah, I I might I might agree. In fact, I might move that up to the top because as you said, I have one in every door. 
I have at least three in the four doors on my truck now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, the dog, you can run up on, even out on the upland hunt, you get to the end of a block, you see a lot of traffic all of a sudden on the side of the road, you drop that lead on. You step out in a parking lot, all of a sudden cars start coming, big trucks start coming by, you're trying to air your dog, you can drop the lead on. So that's just, uh, that's just one thing I always have. I love it, and it's it's absolutely true. So in uh, learning more about the Wild Rose Way, I learned about Wild Rose Law number five. Make haste slow, slowly. Uh, make make haste slowly. I'll have to go. work on that. <laughs> Speak about making haste slowly. Um, uh, I, I heard that a lot in the last few weeks, talking about dog training in particular, and I mentioned it when it came to Waylon, the the Griffon and others as well. Everybody wants to, uh, they want, they want the microwave method of dog training and there is no such thing. But, um, along those lines, here's a question from my good friend and hunting buddy and fan of the show, Mark Van Tilburg. He says, at what age do we start teaching a dog to fetch? The make haste slowly is one of the concepts that we developed that people need to think in a linear manner, uh, what I would call causal relationships. One thing leads to another thing that leads to another. And unfortunately, people think in segments. They'll listen to your podcast and go try that. And then they'll buy a DVD and try that. And then they'll pick my book up and read out to chapter six. And, oh, that sounds fun. Dogs don't learn that way. They learn in a progressive, structured manner, never to the point of boredom. So repetition and consistency minus boredom equals predictable habit. And that's what we want to do. So the question is, when do you start retrieving? I would start them as a very young pup, as we teach in our puppy class. When you come get a puppy from us, you're going to go through two hours of indoctrination. And we show you how to structure the first little retrieve for the pup. But never to the point of boredom. Uh, we about three, three and a half months old, we got the little puppy running doubles. Very easy to do. You set one little bumper out in one direction, set it other and, and another along a straight wall down a hallway where the puppy can't have any other distractions, no way to make a mistake. He goes bouncing out, picks it up, brings it back. Bouncing out, picks it up, bring it back. So we set him out as a 180, 180 degrees apart. So the pup comes back, we immediately send him for the other one. Now here's a concept of if I get something and bring it back, I get another one. And we start that by three and a half, four months old. So you can start them, but ne- just once. Then you skip a day or two and then do it one more time. So what if a pup won't go get it? Okay, fine. Squat down, put the pup between your legs and just roll it down the hallway. And it's going to roll and that prey instinct is going to, he's going to liven up and go after it, try to grab it. And he might not bring it out, but he has no other option because you've got an enclosed hallway that he has no other option to go run, play, jump in the lake or chase leaves eliminate all that and just bring the structure back inside the structure inside your garage bring it back to you and a big reward so i start them quite early to awaken that prey drive and but i don't do i just do it infrequently how, how early would you show them a bird maybe twice um by the time he's four and a half months old he may see two birds something like a small a pigeon yeah yeah not a lot because i don't want to overstimulate them and I don't want them to get bored with it just about twice is all I'm going to let them do. Never let them play with it. Always in an enclosed structure so they can't run off with it. They can't tear the bird up, pluck the feathers. You can go get him if you had to. So we just want to awaken that and get that little early drive coming back and picking them up and coming back. Now, let me give you a footnote to the client. About four and a half months old, you have to stop retrieving because they start cutting their adult teeth. Oh, yeah. And their gums are sore. So between four and a half and six months old, don't do any retrieving at all because their gums are sore and they ju- you're just promoting them. I don't want to pick anything up and it hurts. Or they might chew on it like baby's teething. So you don't want to do either one of those two. Boy, that is uh, that is worth its weight in gold, and I'm sure that's mentioned in your book as well. So uh, everybody out there who's looking for a method, and you you alluded to that as well. I I think it's it's <clears throat> again part of this microwave method of trying to you know move things along too quickly. Um, the best advice I've ever seen when it comes to dog training is find a method, follow it, stick to it. Do not 
pass go do not collect two hundred dollars till you've gotten through the whole method it could be yours it could be somebody else's it doesn't matter but stick with it and do it like you said in a linear manner these dogs that's how they think we know that all right yeah. uh levi shank has a great uh question for you um he uh, says when hunting ducks his dog breaks every time he's worked on it for over a year and during the training it's not a problem in the field it falls apart he just turned two and i he doesn't believe all is lost and levi i i i, I know how you feel uh and it is not all <laughs> lost and here is mike uh, mike stewart of wild rose kennels to tell you what you should be working on go ahead mike well one of the levi one of the things that we emphasize is delivery to hand the other one preferably of an uneaten bird nice bring back but nice delivery the second one uh, that's indicative of the wild rose methodology of a wild rose dog is the steadiness we put mm-hmm. a lot of emphasis on steadiness for upland flushes uh, backing bird dogs to duck hunting and the duck blind no, and steadiness means there is no whining there's no breaking and running in there's no going out and t- stealing birds from other dogs and making retrieves scuffling around all that has to do with steadiness, including whining. So now how to get a dog to do that? We spent a lot of time in our book and on our DVDs on things, the three Ds of steadiness, deny, delay, and diversions. You can learn more about that going to uklabs.com and looking at some of our videos on there. I have a whole Upland series just completed last winter with Tom Beckby on how to train an Upland dog. There's some good stuff in there on steadiness that still applies to duck dogs. So this is really good cross training. Then let's take our problem solving matrix again. Is it genetic? Like produces like. No, I doubt it. You could have steadied that dog. So number two, we need to look at the method you're using. You're throwing a lot of bumpers, giving them a lot of marks, firing a lot of launchers, and immediately as soon as you fire the launcher, you send the dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't train with other dogs, making them honor. You're not putting any denials. That means you go get the bumper yourself, or another dog goes and gets it. You never structured that dog to be steady. Uh, relationship, let's look at that. The, on the relationship side and the handler's ability side, there's four levels of training. There's yard work, field work. Sounds like you're doing fine there. He's steady there. Transitional work, is. this is what's a missing link in a lot of I- individuals doing their training. It's practices you will play. It's scrimmaging. Mm-hmm. It's war games. you got to dress the part get the water stands out, put ducks out, and fire shotguns, and then you work on your steadiness. And then here's the other problem, and this is a big one with my clients. As soon as they pick the dog up, they want to go hunting. Well, that's hunting is just a continuation for the first year of training. You're not hunting at all. You're still training in real-life situations. So one shot, one kill, You, you might, it's a close bird. You walk out there and pick it up yourself. You do it at all. You give the other dogs opportunities and then your dog as a reward gets to go but if he's getting to go on every shot you're hunting him too early you're giving him too many birds too early you're going to have a very unsteady dog and it's difficult to correct without force which is a uh, ev collar so a lot of it has to do with our methodology and a lot of it has to do with our relationship with the dog we pushed them too fast we got them too excited we hunted them too quick put them on birds too early we didn't make them honor in the duck blind. We didn't do any transitional training. If you got any of those blanks, check. You know where your problem is. Amen to that. And I, I will just amplify again on that. I, I gunned a lot for some NAVDA tests over the summertime and in early fall. And, and a lot of those advanced NAVDA tests, people were bringing dogs in that were had never been in a testing situation before. And to a degree in the younger dogs, it hadn't been hunting per se before and all of a sudden they're thrown into a high pressure situation without like you called it a scrimmage i love that term i uh, when i was in the music business we had a dress rehearsal before every show sure, and it's sure the same did. thing it, uh, it's all that stuff it's all the other stimuli that they're not getting uh in the yard um how about locations uh, you know uh, you talked earlier about five five locations and five different skills and that sort of thing um the same thing apply for these scrimmages should we be simulating a a hunt whether it's an upland hunt or a waterfowl hunt in different locations before we actually do the hunt itself 
Uh, dogs don't generalize well. Yeah. Generalization means that I can show you how to pitch, put a widget together in the classroom. Then I'll watch you do it. Yep, that's the correct way to do it. And now you can go stand in the lake and do it. Uh, that Dogs don't transfer skills like that very well. They have, But they're extraordinarily good at place orientation as one of our laws. So you have to, it, to, to through repetition and consistency, we show them what to do. Then I have to move it to five times in five different locations, and they perform it correctly before I can get anywhere close to saying I have a habit. So let's say heel work would have to be done in five times in five different locations. One of those locations is in the water. Have you ever taught your dog to heel in the water? Well, you're going to have to drag those decoys in in the morning, but you don't practice that one. Or high grass. I get my pups really early healing in high grass because you're going to do that on upland. So we have to do it in five locations or we don't have a habit. And that could be a part of steadiness, and it could be a part of a failure in the field that becomes frustrating because the first time your dog sees a hunting situation should not be sunrise on opening day. You know, you've got to practice as we will play. And I, I'm writing that one down because it's exactly correct. And I've seen it in, in athletics. I've seen it in the music business. And I've lived that horror over and over again, training dogs over the last 25 years. Um, it's hard for some people. And, and this is a question. I had a discussion with somebody just last night who said, well, it's really hard for me to do some of these things because I don't have a training partner or somebody says I don't have a big enough field to work in or I don't have enough wild birds to use or birds of any sort. Um, how do you overcome those things with your clients and their dogs and, and your methods? Uh, I, I mean, let's just address those one at a time. What if you don't have anybody you can train with? Uh, that's probably the most difficult one that you brought up for our clients. Uh, one of the things we do is refer them to other clients in the area. The second thing you can do is go to a workshop of the method that you like. The, most trainers have workshops around the country, whether it's the bird dog trainers, there's some good ones out there. We have what we think are very good workshops scattered around the country from New York, Alabama, Texas. Uh, go to a workshop, and you'll get that group training there. And then you can connect with people at that workshop that are in the region. Uh, sometimes you can find them by asking questions on the blog. The problem is you get a lot of people that may not agree with what you're doing. Sometimes uh, hunt tests and uh, I mean hunt test clubs will work, but a lot of them don't train our way. So our cl clients tend to go to some of them. The next thing they do is want to strap collars on them and force fetch. So they have a particular problem sometimes finding people to work with that uses our unique method. But there are people out there. And so you can t contact a trainer that does it and say, do you have any clients in my area? Uh, sometimes vets know somebody that's trying to do it their dog, their dog and work their dog, and uh, y'all get together and work it that way. It's you know, just networking. It, it is, and, and we are, uh, we're uh, as as hunters per se, we are reluctant to, to do that as much as other people. We're, we're kind of independent. We're kind of hard headed. And like you said, you put any two bird dog trainers together and you get at least three opinions and that, <laughs> that becomes a problem when you're trying to teach somebody else or where you, when you're trying to learn something yourself. But, you know, if you're a little bit adamant about it and all you need is a guy to put his dog on point so you can teach backing, then none of those philosophical issues become a problem. You're just doing what you want to do, and he's doing what he wants to do, and it happens to work. But uh, well, a lady called me just the other day. If, uh, it has a Griffon, and uh, one of the guys that took my course up in New York, I helped him a lot with his dog, and he referred her to us. And she said, what is the closest place to come to a workshop? Well, at that workshop, she's going to meet other people in that region. And from there, I think she can spawn into something. So you can do it at workshops. You can do it by contacting a trainer and say, I really like your method on uh, bird dogs or spaniels or whatever it is, and say, are you conducting workshops or can you refer me to a client that has your same belief system? Love it. And uh, just just for the record, because this becomes a real issue um, in, in much of the country, um, you know, we just don't have the ground to do a lot of this stuff. And I'll give you a perfect example. And I'm not making an excuse for me because I think I've, I've solved this to a small degree. I live out in the desert. So getting water that is of the right kind to teach uh, what we use in NABDA, we call the duck search. Uh, it's pretty hard. 
But if you throw water out of the equation, I've got hundreds of acres of desert behind my house where I can teach everything about the duck search except the swimming. Um, right. You you know is there is there a way for you your do your clients um, are you able to help them even if they just have a little tiny yard in an urban setting are there uh, would you agree there's ways to solve those problems if you just think about it a little bit? Well, absolutely. Our methodology, the Wild Rose Way, is based on a low force structure that the average person can use. It's through repetition and consistency. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts. So the method works really, really well for the urbanite that most of our clients are. Most of our clients live in environments that they don't have the resources that we have at Wild Rose of river training facilities and upland training facilities. And Delta, we got a place in the Delta. So once the dog comes out of training, they're more, more restricted on what they can do. But you can still find things. You can look around and find different things. I tell them a lot of times, go to the, uh, go to the high school. There's a baseball park down there, and they've got excellent fences to line your dog down. So you can look around. Um, the dog park is not where to go because there's all kinds of scent out there and other dogs urinating and things like that. That is definitely not the place to go. But there's usually fields around um, that somewhere. I, I also use um, somewhere in your neighborhood. But I've also used industrial parking lots that are closed, like big factories. Mm -hmm. They'll have rows and rows and rows a parking area is a lot of times with plants run running running in lines and different angles. You can do all kinds of training in there. Across those lanes, down the lanes, back casting, left and right, all in that parking lot after work. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. I use those a lot um, for two things. Number one, on the road when you just need to exercise the dog. But number two, depending on where it is, you get up early enough and you can, you can find an empty parking lot in a lot of places. Yeah, uh, colleges, colleges yeah. will have grounds. They have all kinds of different stuff you know, around different places, that, uh, uh, the parameters of the campus. There's going to be places on colleges. There's cemeteries. There's all kinds of things if you start looking around that you can find. Now, big water sources, maybe not. Maybe what you have to do, like I did when I was working full-time, is I would train three days a week, usually after work, and then go somewhere on the weekend. Yeah. And trained yeah. off excellent dogs. You know, and, and we see that a lot in the in the versatile dog world. People will meet for the weekend somewhere and, and do yeah. a lot of that. And, of, of course, the, the biggest challenge there, and you've mentioned boredom. I'm going to call it burnout. you got you got to jam so much training into a weekend. If you're not careful about how you pace it, uh, that dog can turn off, as you've called it, avoidance, uh, just out of sheer boredom, if nothing else. How do you change uh, how, how do you change things up enough? Is it about rotating dogs through and doing other th if you had a weekend and you did back in the day, uh, how would you keep your dog on task? Well, we do it at, throughout the year. I do it. Yeah. I go into uh, San Donna. I do four day workshops there. I do them in, in, in Alabama. We do them in Oxford. What we do is we tell the people which they don't like, put the dog up. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? We go into a classroom setting first and I teach all the patterns, the behaviors, the that we're going to be doing looking for in the field the philosophy behind it how to solve the problem read the dog all, whatever the lesson is going to be then we go out and i demonstrate it and then we get the dogs out yeah and yeah. so the lesson in the field probably is not more than an hour mm -hmm. so initially the clients don't like that they want to be out there all day throwing stuff but the dog's not learning anything after that first 40 30 minutes he's not learning a thing except how to be, avoid how to sniff the ground how to pee on things he's always learning but he's not learning the structure that you want i, I remember back in another life i i was a fly fishing instructor and the last thing i wanted anybody to do was take out a rod for this <laughs> <laughs> because yep. all they want to do is cast and look like brad pitt and a river runs through it so you leave them in the building and uh, they still pee on stuff but they weren't practicing their casting so uh, I know exactly what you mean, and it is so and true. We break, well, we break for lunch then. Yeah. And we put the dogs up, and then we, put, we go back in the classroom again. Always after lunch, they're back in the classroom for an hour to hour and a half of what we're going to do in the afternoon. So we get the instruction down. They can take their notes. They know what I'm talking about when we go out there. I take a dog out and I demonstrate it. Now go get your dogs. Yeah. That's the way I teach it. So, so the dog doesn't burn out. And that's what happens at the clubs. 
they don't do that, it's kind of, you know, what I would do is have the class take one or two dogs out at a time and then run the lesson and put those up and take some more out so they don't burn out. Yeah. And look, we're back, I don't want to say burn out. They lose interest. Yeah. It may as well be the same thing. That Then they're, then they're phoning it in. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our methodology is, I mentioned again, is repetition plus consistency minus boredom. Yeah. Times, five times in five locations, you got a predictable habit. Boy, oh boy. If, if only I could have boiled it down to that about five dogs ago. Um, <laughs> uh, we're, we're running a little short, but I, I really would love to know, and, and you have this because you get it every day. There's feedback from so many sources uh, of all of the challenges dog owners face and you get all this bubbling to the top through all of your networks, what is the biggest challenge to most dog owners? Well, one, they bought the wrong dog. Mm. And after that would be being consistent. Uh, talking about buying the wrong dog, the average guy that's never had a, we found this, this is one of the things we did with the Ducks and Limited dogs is we tried to say buy a duck dog, don't buy a cross between two national field trial champions because you've got a nitrile burning car. The thing is going to be way over the top from what you can handle. Great dogs, but you're not running the nationals. You're running a duck hunt. You need a quiet dog that's a steady dog that's a game finder. So they bought the wrong dog. I find it a lot in the adventure dog. They go buy a hound or, or rescue a hound. Oh, gosh. And then, they, and then they want to go out on trail and keep the dog with them on, at heel. I said, well, they've been bred for 150, 200 years to chase game, and you got the wrong dog. A beagle is not a great trail dog because he's going to want to run every piece of game that jumps up in front of him. So they bought the wrong dog. Second one would be is that our lives are so fractured today. There's a lot of running. There's a lot of going. Nobody's at home. The telephones are ringing. The texting, texting, texting. Oh, that drives me crazy when everybody's texting in that class instead of paying attention to their dog. The detachment of the handler, and they want an easy fix. Yeah. You know, I got this. Now I want an easy fix. Push, push, push. And now what's the push button? That's fixed. Okay, now I get back on my phone. I get back on my text. They're so fractured, and dogs don't respect leaders like that. They want stability. They want dependability. They want structure. And our lives, you know, the professional life now is just not that way. And that's the biggest challenge. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, and I'm just going to uh, tag it on to this. And they want it all to be delivered in a calm and reasoned manner. Am I, am I good on that? Yeah. They want stability to yeah. follow a leader. So let's take gun shyness. Yeah. That hasn't been mentioned. That's another big one. People gun shy and they all call it. How do I fix that? Well, you got to do this, this, and this, and this before you can think about it. Fixing yeah. gunshot. No, I just want to fix the gunshotness. Well, no, you've got to go back. You got to go back. You have to take two steps back from any problem you have, mm -hmm. and build a structure based upon success, reward, success, predictable habit before you can fix the actual problem you have. You know, a lot of those things, people are looking at the surface and they see what I'll call the 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 outward sign. The 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 surface the the manifestation of the problem is what they see but the causes of the problem are deeper and uh and they don't analyze those like you said they want that pill that just knocks the top off of the problem unfortunately then doesn't that just bring up the other parts of the problem well i can yeah you don't really know what the core you have to figure out in, in your problem solving matrix you have to figure out what the core problem is yeah Let's say there's three of them. There's three problems there. Won't deliver the hand. He's spooky on the gun, and he's not steady. Which one do you fix first? You can't fix them all at one time. Everybody wants to do that. They want to fix a fast fix so they can get back to the duck blinds. You got to pick out the core problem and work it out from there. So you, you, it's another situation you get into is along the same lines as your knee hurts, and you call a doctor and say, "Doctor, my knee hurts. Tell me, tell me what I should do." Well, he doesn't know. You, you've got to get to the core problem of why your knee hurts. You, you've got to go in and get it tested and some x-rays and say, okay, this is why your knee hurts, and this is what you've got to do to fix it. That's what the trainer has to do, and that's what the client or the handler, let's stop trainers, let's not talk pro trainers, let's talk handlers. That's what the handler has to do. What is the core problem? Fix that and then work it out from there. Oh, yeah. So think and then think again and then dig a little bit deeper. 
Mike Stewart, if we want to learn more information about Wild Rose Kennels, uh, tell me one more time the, the website address just so we got it straight here. Pop on UKLabs.com. You can search Wild Rose Kennels, or you can search UKLabs.com. Stands for United Kingdom Labs.com. If you want to get us to your, our main site, then you have the choices of Oxford, Dallas, or Hillsboro. A lot of our videos are on there complimentary. You can order our book, which is Training the Wild Rose Way, published by Orvis, and you can order it right off our um, website, which is about 290 pages. With It's basically it's, it's a pretty picture book. It's a big book, but it's our methodology of balanced training with a lot of diagrams, and we have two production DVDs that complement that as well. One is for Upland, and one is for the basics, one to, of the twelve of the 16 lessons of the basic gun dog. So we have those available for you as well. Wow. Uh, this has been enlightening. I hope down the road we can do it again. We're just scratching the surface here on some of these questions, but you have changed a lot of people's thinking, Mike Stewart at Wild Rose Kennels. Thanks for being uh, an integral part of the Upland Nation podcast. During the holidays, I wish you the best. Uh, be safe out there and like I said, watch out if you're in Colorado because I may be stopping by sometime and I'll bring a fly rod and a German wirehead pointer. Well, we've got places for both of you. Now, don't you go away, listeners, because here at the Upland Nation podcast, we've still got a few more fun things to talk about, including a public access location for you and our new feature, Ask Me Anything, with your calls and questions. It's all coming up right after we take a close look at the Dogtra T&B dual training collar system. I'll call it a system because it's actually two collars. You can run two dogs off the same handheld, and the joy of it is they have two sets of buttons on that handheld transmitter, so you're not toggling back and forth. You can keep your gloves on because you don't have to press on a touch screen of any sort. The TNB Duel is my training collar of choice. I'm using both on one dog. Flick is learning two things, steadiness to wing shot and fall, and that's why we have one collar on his flank. And then he's learning how to retrieve slightly better than he has in the past or on the shows you've seen him on. And that collar is on his neck. I can control them both with one hand while I'm lobbing dead birds or I'm doing anything else with a shotgun to keep him steady. Use the code SLUN10 and get a 10% discount on any purchase over 200 bucks. Free shipping on any purchase over 200 bucks. It's the Dogtra T&B Duel or anything else they have there. And you can learn more at Dogtra.com. Yeah, in this United States, this land is your land. And I got a news flash for you. There is publicly accessible private land for you and me, even in a state known for ranches you can so big you can see them from space, Texas. Yeah, folks like uh, the private jet landing set and the big dollar hunting operations, they got their spots, but for 48 bucks, you can get a public hunting permit that opens thousands of acres of walk-in access on private property. You can then boast to everybody else in your hunting fraternity that you did a Texas quail hunt, even if you never did visit the King Ranch. Get the maps online and then start packing for your own Texas private land quail hunt. One more reminder that your hearing loss is cumulative. Learn more about how it works and then shop the options at ESPAmerica.com. I did digital solutions to your hearing loss before it happens, custom fitted, and you can have that custom fitting done right in your own hometown. Learn more at ESPAmerica.com. Okay, as I said, you know, it's time to ask me anything. It reminds me of my 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 younger days and, and also my days at Pheasant Fest every year. In fact, you look forward to meeting you there if you're going. On the phone with me is Dan Lesson. Dan, you're from up in that country that I know so well, maybe southwest Washington. Does that sound about right? That's right. I'm on the Palouse. 
All right, so um, here's the challenge. Uh, I'm ready for just about any question about birds, bird dogs, and bird hunting, uh, so go ahead. Uh, my question was, uh, what is your favorite way or ways to prepare your game for the dinner table? Yeah, um, man, I wish you hadn't asked right now. I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if If I were forced to choose one recipe... Um, it, I would make a pot pie out of every game bird I ever shot. Mm. Okay. Um, there is nothing more delectable to me, and it sounds especially good right at this moment, <laughs> than a gravy-soaked wad of any game bird with a few vegetables just as a nod to my wife. <laughs> all in or the doctor. Yeah, yeah. All <laughs> encased in a big crust so yeah, so pretty good you know follow any recipe you like um if you're looking for the liquid i this was years ago when i was doing radio shows for field and stream and outdoor life the the food guy at the time in the magazines he didn't use water he didn't use broth or anything stock or anything he used a good stout for his oh. liquid and all of a sudden your pot pie goes to the next level so th <laughs> there there's my one um that's, in that's gen good. in general here are the things that 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 i i've learned the hard way um game birds obviously are leaner than even domestically mm -hmm. raised poultry so mm -hmm. there's no fat so you got to cook them fast and hot or they'll dry out mm -hmm. um and again, these pros that I've talked with over the years will all tell you that you cook game birds until they're rare. Take them off the heat, and by the time you're ready to serve them, they'll be medium rare. Yeah. So be careful about that, and um, you should do fine. If you're looking for one other one, it's one I'm actually going to make tonight. I got a whole bunch of pheasant legs and thighs that are going to be put in the pot, cooked up, picked off and turned into the same thing you would do with a can of tuna. I'm going to make a oh. salad out of those. And, oh, gosh, sorry, I'm drooling all over the control board. Um, another Your one. Your microphone, please. And, <laughs> and, and what, what that does, both of those, the pot pie and the salad both, um, they'll turn believers into anybody short of a hardcore vegan because they're so <laughs> familiar, you know? Yeah. Everybody yeah. likes one or the other or both of those. And, and you can do so much with that stuff once it's all mixed up and extra onions for me. Sure. Um, yeah, roll them up in a tortilla, put them in a sandwich, uh, you name it. You cannot go wrong. Sounds good. Yeah, now I'm really mad at you because I still have another <laughs> call to take be before I can go make any of that stuff. So, well, good and uh, and good luck. And for whatever it's worth, uh, in, enjoy those two suggestions. Sounds good. Thanks for, thanks for being on the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you. Fresh off a trip to some of my favorite places with some of my favorite dogs, a fellow Three Devils wire hair owner, Fred Slyfield. Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you very much, Scott. Really enjoy your show. Thank you. I appreciate that. Tell your friends, please, um, and tell your enemies, too. Okay. <laughs> um, you have been to places I didn't get to this year. How's your hunting season gone? Well, it's been pretty good. Uh started in uh, in montana on the opener around lewistown and had uh had some long walks and some good points and uh and managed to get our birds every day but uh you know, had to put a few extra miles on this year but it was it was all good so what's <laughs> uh, on your mind well um you know i guess one of the things is you know kind of you know i've been exploring and and looking for you know new places to go and try and get off the beaten path a little bit so um, I'm just, you know, always, always looking for, uh, another place to go chase birds, whether it's, you know, uh, rooster somewhere out of state or chuckers or huns or whatever. So, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I just, you know, always looking for the, the next best thing down the road to try and find some birds somewhere. So I just wonder, yeah. do you ever have any luck finding new stuff like that? Or I do. And it, in fact, tried and true. Thank you. You'd think that this was a plant or something. You're a shill for me because I'm starting a new website called find bird hunting spots. 
Mm -hmm. because everybody has this question. And if you look at the data and I do, because some of it, I generate and others, I just study Uh The, the biggest challenge we have as a hunting fraternity is finding places to hunt. So um, I'm going to help with that. And, and in the meanwhile, I'm going to help you with it, too. Do you want to stay close to home or do you want to go far away? I am willing to go anywhere. After 30 years of work and being retired now, the yeah. the two things in life I worry about is what horse I ride and what gun I shoot anymore. So Okay. Well, and where, and where I'm packing my dog to the next time on a trip. So. All right. So the first part you got solved because you got a three devils wire hair. And then hopefully you got a Tennessee walking horse, too. Well, I ride mules, so that's oh, just as good. <laughs> it's better still. You know, Lynn, one of my camera guys, if you see great pictures of dogs that are close up on that TV show, that's my my favorite mule tier, Lynn Berland. He's my cameraman on that assignment, and he does Perfect. a great job. So we're we're on the same wavelength, Fred. Oh, great, great. So you know, if if I had to if I had to suggest to somebody with your experience, I I would probably probably head for uh southwest or western kansas wow um and not just because the state sponsors my tv show um but because number one the last three years they've had great bird numbers Mm -hmm. um a couple other things they love hunters um there is a ton there's a million and a half publicly accessible acres out there some are garbage Some of them are not. I hunted four days straight this fall and had great habitat and good bird numbers in every spot I went to. They even go so far as to offer up incentives and contests and prizes and money and all sorts of things in southwest Kansas to get you there and to keep you there. More than anything, though, they, they, and I guess that's all part and parcel, really, they understand that hunters are an important part of their economy and granted so does south dakota yeah well that's good to hear because there's a lot of states i don't think that are doing enough to foster that and try and keep people coming back so yeah yeah it's hard to find housing in some of these small towns but but Mm -hmm. you can find it in any number of ways and and again the chambers of commerce and and folks like that will help you with that real easily Uh Uh, the other thing i like about kansas well it's a whole bunch of things actually and i know i sound like a commercial because i i wrote the commercial for them but uh the C, you buy a, you buy a license it's for 365 days so uh-huh. you can wow. go late one season and early the next season mm-hmm. uh number 2 it's a later they start later their their pheasant opener which is their quail opener too by the way is usually i think it's like the second saturday in november mm-hmm. which is fine because you can always hunt you know later and that's the best part is the weather is always going to be good better it's going to be better south of south dakota than it is in south dakota right. so so yeah, the, well, I've, I've hunted north dakota for over 25 years pretty much every year i didn't make it this year um but yeah we've had days of 25 below zero up there late season pheasant hunting so yeah um, and, and, the, and i know that feeling i've been there too um I, i'd rather be somewhere else <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I got Arizona on the radar here one of these days for quail too. Yeah, so that's going to yeah. be the the real nice wintertime hunt. Well, I got some I I got some hints for you on that once we get that uh, website up and running. Okay. Um, there will be a there will be a whole bunch of advice on hunting the southwestern United States, including certain aspects of Arizona that you may not have thought about. So, uh, okay. all in all in the hopper uh, any day now. Actually, uh, that thing will go live, and then we'll be adding to it uh, daily. Um, wow, are you going to allow outsiders to have input on spots and stuff too? Or yeah, that- yeah, working on a way for everybody to share. Now, yeah, you know, just for the record because i know i'll get an email if not a nasty phone call i'm not going to say go to latitude this longitude that and hunt that spot i'm going to keep it slightly more general but slightly Mm -hmm. more specific than uh, the folks who are out there who really don't know and these are virtually all places i've been to 
So um, I'm not just making this stuff up. Very nice. Yeah. So um, so watch for that and for a way for you to kick in and I'll moderate it all so that nobody is getting the exact state highway intersection that they need to park at and uh, walk in yeah. that direction. But yep. Yep. Hoping for that real soon. And in the meanwhile, uh, take care of those mules and that good looking wire here. And uh, happy new year. Okay, well, same to you, and happy holidays to you and the whole crew down there. Thank you so much. Good to talk okay, with Scott. you, Fred. Thank you. Bye. Well, I hope you learned as much as I did. Thank you, Mike Stewart at Wild Rose Kennels. Thank you, callers. Ask me anything. We're going to keep doing that. It's a lot of fun, and I love trying to, trying to you know help out in my own small way. If you'd like to ask a question or be a part of the podcast, go to the Upland Nation Facebook page or the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. You can always correspond with me via email at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com or you can private message me on the Facebook pages. Do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast, rate it or review it wherever you get your podcast feed. All of that stuff helps for all sorts of reasons, including finding sponsors who can pay for the dang thing. Yeah, it is that helpful, and I appreciate your help in advance. The season's still on around here. For some of you, I hope it is still going strong. Get out there, hug your dog, be safe in the field. Happy New Year. Make one of your New Year's resolutions to take somebody else hunting who's never been before. Thanks for listening. I'm Scott Linden. See you in the field.